sponsored by Surfshark VPN. We all take fresh water for granted, but we shouldn't. Based on the World Wildlife Fund, by 2025, two-thirds of the global population may experience water scarcity. And that's because of global warming-driven droughts. Supply cuts are looming in the southwestern US, and water is fueling wars across the world. So how can we get out of this deep water? There's a sea of desalination technologies coming up, like solar domes in the desert, or nanomembranes making seawater drinkable in minutes. Let's take a look at how nanotechnology could help contain the freshwater crisis. I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. Before diving into the wellspring of fresh nanotechnologies, let's zoom in on the water crisis just for a minute. It helps to give context for why this could be transformational. With climate change, many regions are experiencing higher temperatures and lower rainfall. This is a lethal combination that dries out our water reserves. A typical example of this is the southwestern United States. Over the last 20 years alone, the average temperature in some regions of the southwest increased by up to 2 degrees Fahrenheit, or 1.11 degrees Celsius. To add to that, since 1990, the entire region has become drier because of moderate to severe droughts. Based on a 2020 study, this trend was caused by the first climate change-driven mega-drought hitting the southwestern states. Researchers found that this could be the second driest spell affecting the region in the last 1,200 years. Now, what's happening here is happening in other areas of the world, too, but it shouldn't be a surprise. But how is this affecting our water resources? Well, 40 million people living across seven southwestern states rely on Lake Mead for fresh water supply. That's where Las Vegas gets 90% of its water from. Created by blocking the Colorado River with the Hoover Dam, Lake Mead is also a hydropower plant, generating enough clean electricity for 8 million Americans. While still being one of the largest water reservoirs in the world, this massive pool is getting emptier by the year. The Colorado River's flow dwindled by about 20% compared to the last century, and it may shrink by up to 31% by the middle of this century. But it's not just the lack of water falling from the sky that's causing this shortage. Scientists revealed higher temperatures are playing a key role. As the region is warming up, snow is disappearing from the Colorado Rocky Mountains. The snow-free patches absorb more sunlight and become hotter, which causes more water to evaporate from the land and to be given off by the plants. All this means a lower amount of water will make its way towards the river, eventually reaching the lake. After dropping by 140 feet, or about 44 meters, since 2000, last June, Lake Mead's level hit the bottom. Well, not literally, but it was a record low and is expected to continue dropping over the next few years. You can actually see a visible sign of lake drainage, a statue of Liberty High Pale Fringe all the way around the lake shoreline. Now, this is usually called a bathtub ring phenomenon. The lake is now just 36% of its full capacity, and what's even scarier is that it's only 200 feet or about 61 meters above the so-called dead pool level, which is when water can no longer come out of the dam, so this affects not just drinking water, but generating electricity. But which are the most thirsty culprits for water scarcity on a global scale? If you're thinking about cutting down on your drinking water, don't bother. Keep gulping your gallon of water a day. Drinking, washing, and toilet flushing combined only account for about 8% of our yearly freshwater consumption. Instead, the elephant in the pool is actually irrigation for agriculture, which drinks up about 70% of our freshwater use. The average water footprint of a single California almond is 12 gallons, or about 54.5 liters. That's just nuts. And whenever we buy a product, whether it's a cup of coffee, a can of soda, or a t-shirt, there's a water cost to add to its price tag. However, when you compare all of those to meat, they're just a drop in the bucket. One kilogram, or about 2.2 pounds, of common cattle feed, like alfalfa, takes about 510 liters, or 112 gallons, to grow. And whenever you eat a quarter-pound hamburger, you're technically flushing it down with around 1,650 liters, or about 363 gallons of water. So what's the result of all this water consumption? For Lake Mead, it's a lower energy production, with the Hoover Dam energy efficiency dropping by 25% after reaching its lowest water capacity. And of course, there's less water available for people in the Southwest to use. Last August, the US government officially declared the first ever water shortage for Lake Mead. This will cause cuts in water supply with some farmers who may be forced to give up on cultivating their land. Arizona will lose the biggest slice of the Colorado pie, which amounts for about 8% of its national water usage for agriculture and human consumption. That's why the state is considering the construction of a desalination plant on the Sea of Cortez in Mexico. Now, based on the UN World Bank, drought could drive 700 million people out of their homes by 2030. Such a massive climate migration could brew up political instability across the globe. It's already happened. 
The Pacific Institute put together a log of 925 water conflicts since the Babylonian civilization. They concluded that most of the wars were agricultural related, and research showed water-based conflicts increased around five times over the last 100 years. So what can we do to get out of this? This is where technology comes in. But before I get to that, I'd like to thank Surfshark for sponsoring today's video. I always recommend using a VPN when using public Wi-Fi, but VPNs can be very useful even when you're at home. A lot of online services use some pretty sophisticated commercial targeting and tracking, and a VPN can protect you from that. Surfshark's clean web does a great job blocking ads, trackers, and malicious websites, making it safer to use the internet even at home. And you can even make it look like your IP address is coming from a completely different country. This can come in handy if you want to stream a video that's only available from a specific location. One of the best parts of Surfshark is that it's easy to set up on all your devices, whether that's iPhone or Android, Mac or PC. Surfshark is the only VPN to offer one account to use with an unlimited number of devices. Use my code to get 83% off plus four extra months for free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it out for yourself. Link in the description below, and thanks to Surfshark and to all of you for supporting the channel. Now back to how some of these new technologies may be able to help with the freshwater crisis. With surface freshwater running out and underground pools being expensive to get to, everyone is diving into seawater, which makes sense being 97% of the Earth's water resources. Now, desalination plants have increased exponentially over the last 40 years. However, the conventional technique called reverse osmosis has some limitations. I've already talked about the way this works in another video, which I'll link to in the description, but let me give you a quick refresher. Basically, you push seawater through a semi-permeable membrane that traps the salts while letting the pure water go through it. It's simple, right? Yes, but it's energy demanding. And typically, you would burn fossil fuels to get the high pressure that you need to make it work. This translates into 76 million tons of CO2 per year emitted by desalination plants worldwide, which will skyrocket to 500 million tons of CO2 per year by 2040 if we don't find a low-carbon alternative. But there's another environmental cost to add to that. The reverse osmosis process byproduct is a highly concentrated salt solution known as brine that's currently dumped into the ocean. Being heavier than seawater, the slurry settles into the deep waters and the salt overload consumes oxygen, which kills marine wildlife. Now, a reverse osmosis plant could produce up to two liters of brine for every liter of clean water. Now, according to a recent study, its production is 50% higher than what was previously estimated but someone is trying to water down those environmental impacts. Accounting for 22% of the global brine disposal, Saudi Arabia is working on a greener and cheaper desalination technology. Listed in the top nine places that will suffer from water stress by 2040, the Saudi country is planning to quench its citizens' thirst by turning the Red Sea into a fresh water supply source. As part of their Neom project, they asked Solar Water to develop the first ever solar dome. This innovative design is based on concentrating solar power technology. Essentially, you have many large mirrors that focus sunlight onto a glass semisphere. Doing so, a localized greenhouse effect will vaporize the seawater contained within a metallic giant pot. You then pump the steam out and condense it into clean water. Now, based on the developers, the plant will rely on solar energy, which means being carbon neutral. But there's still the question of the waste brine. Their plan is to extract the salts for lithium battery components or grit or fertilizers, but there's still some big question marks around that. So it's good to remain a little skeptical there, but some of these questions will be answered by the pilot plant, which is expected to be finished by the end of 2022. But solar domes aren't the only alternative to reverse osmosis. There's also new materials being used for membrane distillation, which is more energy efficient. Now, I'm not a scientist, but from our research on this, membrane distillation is where a microporous membrane is used to separate two solutions at different temperatures. In this case, salt water and fresh water. The temperature gradient on the membrane creates a vapor pressure difference, allowing the water vapor to pass through the membrane and collect on the other side. Korean engineers designed a nanofiber membrane that desalinates seawater with a 99.99% efficiency. Using a polymer as a core and a silica gel as a shell, they made a composite membrane through a process called coaxial electrospinning. Now hang with me here because this will make your head spin. In this setup, you have two separate coaxial syringes feeding two fluids into a nozzle. When applying high voltage to the system, you create an electrostatic field between the tip of the nozzle and a nearby rotating collector plate. As the droplet comes out of the nozzle, it stretches out, turning into a filament that's collected onto the rotating surface. You end up with a nano layer of material. Thanks to their outstanding water repellency, these electrospun membranes don't get wet. That's a huge plus since wetting has been a major challenge for membrane distillation. Once a membrane gets fully wetted, you have salts sneaking into the output water. Because of this reduction in separation effectiveness, you'll need to replace the membrane. 
Based on their tests, the research group achieved a stable water distillation over 30 days. That's a significant improvement in terms of operational performance as similar membranes start losing efficiency after about two days. Now, according to the study's lead author, these novel membranes show promise for commercialization and could help mitigate the freshwater crisis. However, it's important to note that this has still only been tested at lab scale so far. In a similar realm, there's another composite membrane that could save huge amounts of freshwater. Energy X has recently raised $20 million to develop its direct lithium extraction technology. Currently, most of the world's lithium is extracted from South America salt flats. The way you do it is drilling a hole to pump out metal-rich brine and leaving it to evaporate in ponds for months. Now, doing so, an enormous amount of water is lost. It's estimated that you need about 500,000 gallons or 1.8 million liters of water to make just one ton of lithium. That's enough water for 3,500 people for one year. In Chile's Salar de Atacama, lithium mining takes up about 65% of the region's water, which is crazy if you consider that local farmers need to get water delivered from elsewhere. But Energy X's lithium ion transport and separation technology could dilute the amount of fresh water used by conventional ponds by 95%. The startup uses highly selective metal organic framework nanoparticles, or MOFs. And MOFs can be tailored to specific shapes and patterns to target your filtering needs. In this case, they're starting with lithium, but it could also be used to desalinate drinking water. The best part is that the system is easily scalable. You just roll the membrane sheet into a module and link thousands of them together to create the final unit. EnergyX is planning to start pilot projects for lithium extraction in the coming months, and we may see their device in the market by early 2023. I've got an interview with Teague Egan, EnergyX's CEO, in another video that you can check out. Water scarcity could be a tsunami for the future of our society. Now, clearly we need to focus on the value of fresh water and adopt more responsible consumption, but the scale up of sustainable desalination technologies will be vital. But what do you think? Do you think these new nanotech freshwater solutions can help? Jump in the comments and let me know. And thanks as always to my patrons and welcome to new Supporter Plus member Jay Travis and producer Cameron Stevens. Your direct support really helps with producing these videos. And speaking of which, if you like this video, be sure to check out one of the ones I've linked to right here and subscribe and hit that notification bell if you think I've earned it. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.